and welcome back to another edition of Inside Great Lakes Sailing. My name is Greg Norman, your host. Well, before we move outside to get our boats ready for a splash in the next four or five weeks, we wanted to spend some time inside talking, as we always do on Zoom, with some experts and hopefully give you some information that might be useful come this spring and certainly this summer. We start off this uh, show getting a chance to extend our tips from the great sailor Wally Cross and his system sailings program. Wally's going to join us from Quantum in St. Clair Shores and talk a little bit about the boats, the insides of the boats, and all the things you might want to consider before you actually get working on those boats to get them ready for spring. Wally's got some great tips, and I think that's something that we all want to pay attention to. Now we're going to move up a little bit up the lake and go to the Clinton River area, and North Star Sail Club is going to be hosting the National Catalina 22s race in uh, June 10th through 13th, and we're going to stop in and spend some time with Regatta Chairman Jim Hodson. Jim's going to talk about getting ready for the race, there's uh, sailors from as far away as Texas, Alabama, and Florida already registered. About 40 boats hopefully will be on the line. And all that it means to be a regatta chairman, but we're also going to discuss a little bit about Pure Michigan and how they factor into the race. It'll be a, a fun conversation. And I think the other part of the chat that we need to think about is that Catalina 22s are not exactly hybrid race boats. But they have an unbelievable devotion and following from their fleet. And Jim talks a little bit about what it's like to be a a Catalina 22 racer. We're also going to hopefully check in with our one of the regular voices we'd like to use this summer in Clark Chapin from the Portage Lake Yacht Club. He's a former member of the U.S. Sailing Board of Directors as its secretary in 1996, a variety of posts within U.S. Sailing, and one of the most renowned sailing judges and PROs in the Midwest. And we're going to talk about judging and all of the sail rules that go with it, and a little bit about the structure of where sailing is headed. Clark will hopefully be one of our voices, much like Dwayne Burgoyne from North Cape Yacht Club has been for us. And I think it's a great addition to the family because we're going to be able to check in with Tim. We've got big boat guys. Now we're going to spend some time making sure we cover those smaller boats. We think that's important. I think Clark will give us a, a terrific insight. He's been in, highly involved at the highest levels of U.S. sailing and certainly competition around the Midwest, if not the country. And I think he lends a, a very credible voice. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. How does somebody end up as a referee official? What does it mean? And do we start to figure out how to maybe recruit some more uh, race officials and kind of handle that whole subject? But Clark is a really good conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. And you'll see him throughout the summer talking about uh, various aspects of uh, the rule book. We talked to Dave Perry last week. We're obviously going to cover some rules today with, with, uh, with Clark. And again, trying to bring you a little bit more discussion on uh, the rules of sailing and all that uh, we do in the summertime. So that said, up next is Wally Cross. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a second. Back, we're talking with our favorite sailor, one of the best in the world, Wally Cross, talking a little bit about system sailing. And Wally's going to give us another tip. I think this tip, if I'm not mistaken, Wally, is tip number four as we get ready for uh, the upcoming sailing season in 2024. So thanks. And it's been a couple of weeks since we had a chance to talk. You had a chance to spend some time down in California racing. I think um, all the way down to Puerto Vallarta. So, Tay, tell us about the race, and then what are we talking about today? Yeah, thanks. Good to see you again, Greg. Yeah, the race was a uh, race from San Diego to Puerto Vallarta. It's a thousand mile race, even though most boats sail longer than that. I think our our distance is a little bit over eleven hundred miles. And I, I I got the pleasure to sail with a bunch of people that I've never met before on a Santa Cruz fifty, and uh, we just had a wonderful time. It was about a day longer than normal. It took six days, two hours. But we are fortunate enough to win our class by a minute and five seconds. So it all ended well. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, no, a lot of fun. It's just really fun sailing down the Baja Peninsula and seeing a different sea life from dolphin to whale. And just a great experience. And Puerto Vallarta is a beautiful place to visit. So if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend it. But get... not, um, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'll... Yeah, but, you know, now, Greg, I'm back home and, it's close to April into March, and we're getting what I call crunch time now, getting boats prepared for the summer sailing. In the Midwest, you know, our season is relatively short. So I know a lot of the people in this area really want to get their boats in the water as soon as possible to enjoy them. But I highly recommend to everybody to take your time and make the boat as perfect as you can before you put it in the water. Because once it's in the water, Rarely does the boat get much more what I call massaging till the season's over. 
So this is the time to really take the effort to make sure, A, the bottom is fair and smooth. B, the keel is symmetrical. The rudder is symmetrical in shape. Um, that all the little things can slow a boat down are fared in. You know, <laughs> it's interesting. Just a little bit of drag on the bottom of the boat makes a huge difference. Back to this Port Varda race, you get a, a weed. We have a keel cutter to cut weeds off the keel, but in the rudder, when you get a weed or two on the rudder, it absolutely slows the boat down. And sometimes you have to stop and back up just to get that one little weed off. So any little thing you can do to make your boat slippery through the water in the bottom, that's priority number one. Priority number two <clears throat> is go through the boat and take absolutely everything out of the boat right now while you can. Everything, anything that's not screwed down should come out of the boat. And just lay that all on a platform and just look carefully at exactly what you need. And prioritize. If it's safety equipment, put it in dry bags, label it, and put it as low in the boat as possible, or any other gear that you think is imperative. But you'll find, and most people find, there's so much stuff on these boats that you just flat out don't need. I wrote an article last fall on what I called gain six seconds and win. And what we did is we took a J120 and took all the stuff out of the boat. But before we did that, I measured the freeboards at the bow and the stern. And then we took all the stuff out of the boat that the boat didn't need to race with and then re-measured the freeboards at the bow and the stern. I ran two experimental certificates through ORC, and the boat was significantly faster with the weight out of the boat. So it's, you know, it, it looks, it turns out that way mathematically, and everything I know about sailing makes the boat quicker sailing later. So... Bottom's fair, keel's fair, bottom's smooth, interior's light. And then keep going up the deck. Make sure the deck is clean. Make sure all the hardware is working, that the winches are greased up this year and working smooth, that your halyards, all your running rigging is just in great shape. Um, at the mast, minimize the windage. Anything you can do to make less windage in your boat from your mast to your boom to your sprit, even to your lifelines. I know a lot of people like to um, <clears throat> put these lacings on the lifelines. The smaller the line, the better, the less windage. It all adds up. So anyway, putting together a successful sailing program is a lot like running a business. You just have to prioritize all the steps necessary to be successful. And I think, Greg, 80% of the success on the water comes before the boat gets on the race course all the stuff we've been talking about preparing the boat. And now you got to shift your attention to the people. The people obviously are critical in the, in the success of the sailing, but you have to organize your group so that not only do you have people that work in different job descriptions well as a team, but also can help you as the owner deal with some of the responsibilities and get the boat prepared to race. You know, Wally, you make an interesting point. And that is over. Never miss uh, the smallest detail. Great athletes in any sport make sure that it's always the little things that, that make a difference, and it does. It may only be one or two percent, but if you play one or two or three percent percentages, whether it be you know another team's weakness or your, or your own strengths, sometimes we forget about those things. And I think it's a it's a, it doesn't matter the sport. You got to really pay attention to detail in everything you do. It's like the ceiling's like having a thousand piece puzzle. Every little piece has to fit. And Greg, not one piece is more important than the other. As a sailmaker, of course, we always emphasize the sails are the most important part. But it's just another piece of the puzzle as the instruments, as the running rigging, as the crew, as the crew's gear, even the lunch, the water. Everything you do to make the boat successful needs to be thought about carefully so that, A, you're doing it proper. B, you're not overdoing it, meaning overweight. Um, but back to the people, <clears throat> again, we're at that point now. We just got to make sure that we, A, have a team, and B, that the group agrees to sail like a team. What we don't want in programs and sailing successful sailing programs is a bunch of individuals that can't not necessarily get along, but don't actually want to sail together as a team. Again, I was so fortunate on this boat sailing to Puerto Varda because I never met these people before. But we just all sort of gelled immediately 
as a team early on. And I could tell that was going to be a great experience, win, lose, or draw. Um, I knew it was going to be a good time. And so that's got to be the emphasis from an owner's point of view is let's get together a team because hey, look at the owner is doing it for fun and his friends are out there for fun too. So the more they can enjoy their time together as a team, the more they're going to want to do it. And that's what's critical to me in the sport that we keep people not only in the sport, but we encourage other people to join in. A lot of times you may be stuck with a splash date with a particular marina or a sail yard that you might be involved in. But if you, if you need to get those things done, usually for the most part, most guys that are, that are running those kinds of facilities are, are, are pretty good about making sure that you get what you need. And I think that's something you got to ask though. I think that's part of that same discussion. Yeah, absolutely. You got to ask. And you know, we're sort of weather dependent here. We've had days that are nice, but again, last week snowed and you just don't know what you're going to get. And you have to have weather on your side to prepare your boat properly. But on those days you don't have the weather, there's other things you can do. You can meet as your, as a crew, as a team, and just kind of prioritize not only what has to be done, who's going to do the work, and then what are we going to practice? Everybody wants to just go race. But, you know, Greg, you know, and skiing and lacrosse and all the different sports you cover, these people aren't good just because they play the game. They're good because they practice. And sailing doesn't, most groups don't have an organized way of practicing. And so that has to be a priority as a team is to figure out, A, when are we going to practice? And then B, what events are we going to focus on? I'd rather see teams practice more and sell less events than a lot of events and no practice. The start of this series of shows, which goes back a long ways, you were one of the first guys we interviewed. And one of the tips I took away from that was that when the boat comes out of the water in the spring in the fall, Put together a list of the things you want to fix the next year because you're not going to remember more often than not. So we would type up our list while the boat was in the water, while we're going back to take it out. And in our case, we'd go from Crescent all the way back up to the Clinton River. So we'd make this nice list. We'd type it out and we put it up right on the inside of the boat and tack it up. When we opened it up in the spring, there's the list of things we had to do. And it's made the process so much easier because it was things we would may have forgotten. It may have been small things. The big stuff, it's obvious. You take care of it. You know, you're going to fix the floor, you're going to repaint, you're going to rechip, whatever you're going to do. But it was those small things. And we've done that now, I think, four or five years in a row, three or four years in a row anyway. And it was a really good reminder because what I know in October isn't necessarily the same thing I remember at the middle of, in the middle of March, you know, five months later. So it's about paying attention to the small stuff. Uh, so, so accurate, yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, even as we age and you and I are about similar age, I've got to write down everything, everything, right. because, you know, I, I can't remember the next day. So but what's cool about writing things down and I encourage everybody to have a set of wet notes is that when you write it down, you remember you don't necessarily have to go back to the wet notes to remember it. You just write it down and it's kind of like writing it in your brain. And you're so right. If you just take make a list at the end of the year and improve, let's just say five things, five items to make your boat a more successful or faster boat, you'll see it each year. And then you'll start getting those results you've always wanted, which instead of fifth places, maybe they're third or fourth or seconds. It's slowly improving every year. But it's a system, it's a process, and it takes um, a simple word called effort. It takes effort to be good at this game. And no one has all the answers. Clearly, I don't have the answers. But what I like doing and, and what's so enjoyable at my age now is that I, if I can learn one or two things every time I go out, I feel I've just hit a gold mine. And that's what the sport's about. It's just trying to absorb a few things, a few tidbits each time, A, you go out, or B, when you talk with people that you can kind of put into your system. Because what I want people to evolve or eventually have is sort of a blueprint on how to sail their boat. So if Joe Blow doesn't show up one day, whoever replaces him or her understands what the system is. Here's the blueprint, and they fit right in. So it, it works. It just takes effort. And now that we've completed four tips on system sailing, we're going to end up, uh, hopefully our next few tips, will be outside on boats, and we can actually see some of the processes that you uh, have put together for us, which I think is terrific. And I you made a point about effort. And I always remember to tell my kids that it takes no talent to provide effort. It just takes effort. And I think that's something, I think that's something that works really well. So Wally, as always, appreciate the time and uh, 
Next time we see you, we'll be on somebody's boat somewhere, hopefully in the next couple of weeks as the weather gets warmer. And we uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, Craig. Welcome back. We're talking to Jim Hodson, a member of North Star Sail Club and up on the Clinton River. Jim, we had a chance to talk to you last year for a, a local Catalina 22 race, but this summer coming 10th through the 13th, our uh, Catalina 22 Nationals. We had a really good luck and op- good fortune last year to see sort of this kind of unusual boat racing, but the guys that, that were in the fleet loved it. So my first question is, uh, you have a national race coming with about 30 competitors from all over the country, Texas and Florida and Alabama. And uh, What is it that uh, takes the most time to get a race like this together? Because I got to think it's just got to be a lot of work. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, the f- first thing you need, need to do is get the support of the club, which I do have, because it's going to take a lot of volunteers to get something like this off the ground. Uh, we've got, I've got a, a group of people on the committee. They're working really, really hard on this, and it just, it just takes a lot of people, and you got to get them on board early. What um, is your biggest job at the moment? Just making sure it all works and moves in the right direction. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a puzzle piece. You you have, uh, you know, early on, you've got the sailing instructions and everything, getting the word out, which we're doing right now. It's open open entry time. Uh, food, we've got our, our national meeting, yearly national meeting is part of this, is organizing that. And uh, just talking it up amongst, uh, amongst the fleet. I was down at the Florida Midwinters down in Cocoa Beach here last month, and uh, good time. Everyone's real excited about coming up. You have the good fortune of having a boat that you can trailer, and North Star certainly has a hoist to get guys in the water, but you've also got the DNR at the end of uh, the South River Road there. So guys can get in and all the water pretty quick, and this is not like you're bringing in a 50-foot boat to deal with. It's a it's a fun 22 that everybody, you know, enjoys sailing, so it's a makes it a little bit easier from a racing perspective to get people from other parts of the country. Yeah. So that was one of the things several years ago when we were first talking about a, uh, a developing a small one design fleet, we have a, uh, a good J 35 fleet at North star we have for quite a while, but we were looking for a boat that had uh, two to four people on it. Uh, small can put it on a trailer towed behind an SUV and we can, with the idea of looking to, to do some trailer and go around see see some other clubs and fleets. Jim, is you mentioned two to four. Are there different levels of racing, or is it no matter whether you have two, three, or four guys, it's it's all the same? Okay. <laughs> Catalina uh, twenty two was never designed as a racing boat. I mean, there are some there's fluctuations in weights and other stuff. We've done a lot to standardize it, uh, you know, to make the racing competitive. But uh, um, they, there's no crew limits as far as weight. There's uh, so you know, I push. I have a tendency to push that weight scale up a little bit when I get on a boat. <laughs> but but it, it's good. You don't you don't have to worry. You can you can't don't have to tell somebody you can't go sailing today because we're one over the limit or you weigh twenty pounds too much. Right, which is great. My. I- the reason I'm asking the question, there's there's not a two-handed division as part of this race. No. Everybody's in the same category. Exactly. What they have is uh, usually most people will sail either two or three people, and most people, three crew members to a boat. Uh, that's, that's very typical. Um, we have three different divisions as far as, far as the uh, sailing goes. We have the Gold Fleet Division, which – where the national champion comes out of, we have uh, a silver fleet where we're trying to get the up and coming sailors involved in that. And we also have a spinnaker division because uh, the Catalina 22 is a jib and main boat uh, for the national championship. But we also have a spinnaker division where if you're registered in the, in the gold or silver fleet, you can uh, uh, sail spinnaker, uh, in a spinnaker fleet in the morning, separate from the gold and silver fleet. Having covered it last year, and you and I had a conversation, and we talked to a gentleman from Alabama, and I forget his name. Keith. This is, is, this is not a ro- boat to be confused that this isn't, these guys can't race. 
These guys, no. can race and these boats, these boats go. And I think that's something that, you know, maybe gets lost in a translation because you typically don't think of a Catalina 22 as being a, you know, sort of a souped up race boat, but I'm going to tell you something right. watching and, and there are some serious sailors in this group and these boats move. Yeah. Well, the, talking about serious, the guys uh, they came up last year were the national champions. They came up out, out of Alabama and I just had a chance to sail with them down in Florida here. And, you know, they basically came up to check out the venue, you know, and uh, see what's going on for this year at our at our uh, throwdown in Motown regatta last August. And uh, he walked, Keith walked away kind of shaking his head a little bit, says, I need to figure out this chop. <laughs> the Lake St. Clair chop. <laughs> but, you know, just the fact that you've got somebody uh, driving up from Alabama sailing a regatta to check out the venue for the following year, you know. So it's not all foreign to them. In the last 24 months, we seem to become, Lake St. Clair has seemed to become a destination. There were certainly laser championships last year at Crescent. We got a couple of national championships, including the Shark Championships coming up this summer, as well as the 22s. And you're involved with the Pure Michigan uh, arm of the government, of the state government, which is sort of the public relations arm. And we all know the great commercials that are that are put out by Pier Michigan. Explain the connection between Pier Michigan, how you guys got involved in that. Well, uh, Pier Michigan is a nationally renowned brand and uh, something that we wanted to get involved with. Uh, and uh, We worked with them on it. We showed them what we were doing and they liked what we were doing. And uh, so, you know, they're going to be have on our site, they're going to have their links so they can get up and if they we're pushing tourism. We've told anybody who wants to, you know, you coming up for our regatta, we'll find a place for you to keep your boat and you can go off and go uh, uh, look at this great state of ours uh, and, and see what Michigan's all about. They provide some financial assistance as well? Uh, no, they don't provide a financial assistance. They just basically their brand or their name. Okay. Uh, it's very, very tightly controlled for a good reason. But uh, they've been good to work with. Entries close when for this championship? Uh, entries, uh, there's a late fee after uh, May 8th. So we're telling everybody to get everything in by May 8th. Um, and that's when we have uh, discount lodging for and everything else. So um, sooner the better. <laughs> and everything I uh, looked at earlier today, everything's up on Yacht Scoring. So if you have any questions on the race, you can certainly look at North Star's website or take a look at Yacht Scoring. I think that'd give you a pretty good insight to whatever might you, any question you may have. Sure, sure. That sounds good. And we have articles up on the Catalina 22 national website. Um, you want to go there, you're interested in the boat, go take a look at that and uh, you can see what's what. I'm reminded of a pre-interview we talked about before we got on the air with this. I have a picture of all the boats at the Mackinac. And it's an aerial view, and you see all these boats crammed together. When you add up 30 boats into the next June, this coming June, when you add all those boats, all those 22s, it's going to be interesting trying to get up the Clinton River with all those boats parked <laughs> two and three deep. So <laughs> if you happen to be in the area, you'll know just to be aware that there's a race going on and everybody isn't trying to you know hinder your way up the river. It's just... They got to park their boat somewhere. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, that that's one of the biggest challenges is with our fleet captain, where he's gonna, uh, where we're gonna get these boats stored in the water at for for the regatta. So we do have to do some creative moving around of boats. You know, I, it, just a, the question pops in my brain: is there a is there a limitation on how far out you can come within the Clinton River? Is there any regulations on that? In the, uh, there, I can't imagine there would be. Boy, you're asking the wrong person. I okay. that I don't know, but just hit what, me we're gonna, what we're going to have is uh, uh, is early in the season. There'll probably be some some of our regular boats that aren't going to be in the water, so we're going to have things available. Some of the smaller boats are going to be pulled out, so we get room for our, our guests. Well, Jim, I so appreciate. Hopefully, it. hopefully, we're not sticking too far out in the river. <laughs> I hear that. Listen, I appreciate your time. We will uh, keep up on this race as it gets near, and we'll definitely be on set to cover it, uh, especially on the awards on uh, on the 14th, the 13th or 14th. 13th. And, uh, again, thanks for your time, and we'll talk to you real soon. Okay, Greg. Sounds good. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Tim. I certainly want to thank Wally for all the information that he brings to us with all of his tips. We'll be moving outside onto boats uh, in the next few weeks, and hopefully that'll be a, a great insight. And we wanted to make sure that you understood what was going on with the National Catalina 22 race. So we thank Jim Hodson for uh, some spending some time with us from uh, North Star. We also are up next with that great race aficionado, Clark Chapin. We'll be back in a second. Welcome back to our last segment. We're talking with um, maybe one of the best rules aficionados in, uh, in the United States, certainly in, in small boats. We're talking with Clark Chapin from the Portage of Lake Yacht Club just outside of Ann Arbor. And we're going to, I, I want to set this up so we're really clear. Clark, we're going to talk about your background because we have had, not had the great opportunity to interview you, but we want to add other voices to our, our stack as we do different kinds of racing. And one of the things we want to be able to do this summer is really talk about smaller boats, which is your you know, that's sort of in your wheelhouse from that standpoint. You've been sailing for a long time. In fact, you used to be the uh, secretary of the U.S. Sailing Board of Governors back in the days when Dave Irish was um, a part of that program. You are a, a longtime official, PRO, at the highest levels. So first of all, thank you for taking some time. And I guess the first question is, how long have you been sailing? Uh well, you know, people ask me, have you been sailing your whole life? And my answer is always not yet. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I think that first, first sail I took was on an inner lake that belonged to my uncle. He had number 173, the 14th fiberglass inner lake ever built. And that was, uh, I think I was six years old at the time, but I really got into it, um, when my dad bought that boat and we sailed it on uh, Belleville Lake before moving it out to Portage. Um, so we did it a couple of years at Belleville Lake and then we moved out to Portage in 1968. <clears throat> so it's been uh, uh, six, 56 uh, years now, 57 years that we've been out there. So We've been involved in a lot of the bigger boats. We want to certainly cover some of the smaller boats. The obvious question and answer is, why are the smaller boats get lost? As again, as you look behind me, you see the bigger boats with spinnakers and the colors and and all that go with it. And certainly, if you're going around a larger lake like Lake St. Clair, you're going to see this the bigger boats. But don't big boat sailors really become great sailors because they started in small boats? Well, I, I'd like to I'd like to think that's true. I know a lot of uh, uh, you know <clears throat> a lot of sailors start out like that. Uh, there are a lot of great uh, sailing programs that teach people to sail. Crescent's got a uh, Crescent's got a good one, and, and uh, even uh, well, uh, Ted Everingham, for example, started out learning and flying Scots um, and uh, club boats. And some people stick to small boats, but yeah, I believe that's true. You learn a lot about the boat handling and uh, maneuvering with small, uh, you know, with small boats and. You know, some people just stick with it, particularly in the racing, because it's overwhelmingly one design. You know, you don't have to worry about your handicap. You don't have to buy a, a beer for the uh, the chief measurer. It's the first boat to the uh, first boat to the finish line wins. You know, I want to talk briefly about your background. I want to read this so I don't miss it, miss, screw it up. You were the chairman of the bylaws committee. From 2006 until the committee became part of the Governance and Compliance Committee for U.S. Sailing in 21. You continue to be a part of that committee. You're a certified judge since 1990. You've been around the Interlakes process. You've certainly been a certified club race officer. You are sort of a AAA, you know, umpire behind the plate. I say this as a 40-year sports official in football and basketball. What went from sailing? What got you? This is a question I asked Dave Perry last week. How did he end up on the rules side of the premise, and what is it was that was about that 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 got you there, and what what kept you there? Because there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of joy. Well, maybe there is some joy, because usually you're getting yelled at. So explain to me how you got involved in that process. Well, you know, years ago, uh, years ago, there was a baseball umpire who wrote his autobiography. And the title of it was, it's the best seat in the house. The only trouble is you have to stand. <clears throat> and a lot of race officer and judging work uh, falls into uh, uh, falls into that category. In my case, 
um, you know, as we got into racing, when we moved out to Portage Lake, uh, you know, we had to, uh, to uh, learn the rules. And <clears throat> uh, I, I think of Dave Perry's comment about people that really don't know the rules being timid out on the race course when they start out. That was certainly our case. Uh, but our club's a little special in that Portage Lake is where the circling penalty uh, was invented in the early 1960s. And of course, before that time, if you infringed a rule, you had to drop out. And Tom Eamon Sr. Uh, thought that, well, I shouldn't wreck everybody's day uh, just to make a simple mistake, maybe even before the starting signal has, went, has gone off. And there ought to be a way that people could continue racing. And really, he's the one that uh, uh, got me interested in studying the rules, encouraged me to become a certified judge when that program, uh, when that program began, um, and really nurtured that. I mean, my, my parents were supportive as well, <clears throat> um, but I'd say uh, he was the single biggest influence that got me to do that, and then. At about, in the late 80s, I was starting to get involved with U.S. Sailing in the One Design Class Council. And because I was a judge and I was interested, I went to a, they had a seminar on the day before the spring meeting in Chicago about the new rule book that year in 1989. And uh, Brian Willis uh, was there as uh, uh, as well as two or three other luminaries, and I and the room was filled with judges, and I really got a kick out of it about the interesting things and the new. Uh, Bill Benson uh, was there, and when uh, you know, and I I knew the name, uh, and that he was on the rules committee, and and he stood up and said, you know, anytime somebody asked him a question, and he says, you know, anytime anybody asks me a rule question, I take the advice of Greg Bemis, who said. The first thing you should do is open up the rule book and reread the rule for two reasons. First of all, it gives you some time to gather your thoughts. And second of all, there might be something there that that you missed. And I thought, well, that's kind of a neat thing for somebody like Bill Benson that I was you know, in awe of uh, for him to say. And and again, Dave Perry being around him for a while. These are the people that have inspired me to try and learn, uh, uh, you know, learn the rules and how they're applied. Uh, you know, it's not true uh, that every night when I go to sleep, I put the appeals book under my pillow. Uh, but, uh, but I have spent some time looking at that and, you uh, uh, I find it interesting how the rules are applied and how the appeals committee um, gives us a, an authoritative interpretation in the case of the uh, world sailing cases or the the U.S. appeals committee. Okay. With the uneducated, you're going to have to go back a little bit because big big okay. in that answer, you talked about the circling rule. So for the uneducated like me, explain what that was, what it is, and how did it have an effect on sailing? Okay, the back before that in the uh, in in the rule book as a default before 1997, if you infringed any of the right of way rules, you know the rules of Part Two or Rule 31 touching a mark, your only penalty was to re the only possible penalty is you had to retire, Good. and as a big penalty, and consequently, people protested each other to because they figured. I thought I was in the right. Why should I have to uh, uh, withdraw? Why should I take the did not finish as a, you know, as a as a rate as a race penalty? And starting in um, uh, well, the way the penalty works now, which is what's important, is that if you realize you've infringed one of those rules while racing, you can take a penalty by immediately getting clear of the other boats around you and doing two sailing and two circles, taking two tacks and two jibes in the same direction and then continuing on in the race. And so it's a little bit more like basketball in that sense. If you foul somebody, you're not benched for the game. Um, you know, the other team gets, okay. uh, it, it pretty much, 
picks you up and puts you behind the boat you follow. Okay, that makes sense. The interesting part you said the the the, the appeals book. You know, I, I always think of a referee. There's a rules book and there's a case book, right? And the case yeah. book is always, you know, it, it's twelve times larger than the, than the rules book because it's obviously the exceptions. Everything in officiating is exactly. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah. Well, they print it in uh, in what I call uh, age appropriate fonts, so uh, that makes it bigger by itself. Okay, if I were to ask your friends that sail, including Tom Even Jr., a uh, member of your club and Portage, would they know your personality lend itself to being an official, to being a referee, to being a spokes, to be an arbiter, so to speak? I think so. You know, they uh, they ask my uh, opinions on, uh, on stuff and and I tell them, well, you know, you have to understand that free advice is worth every penny you pay for it. But uh, but but I think so. They've uh, well, they've uh, recommended me as uh, for the certification when that requires the uh, uh, recommendation by um, by a flag officer of your club. Um, they, they seem to keep entrusting me with stuff. So uh, I, I take that as a vote of confidence. Okay. So l let me just some so, sort of taking care of business things. We're in area E. <clears throat> the country is broken down by apparently alphabetical areas uh, it, across the country. Is that, am I pretty accurate in that? Yeah, that's that grew up uh, out of the old Nehru uh, system that had a bunch of areas, and over time, uh, different areas are created or split in half, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. There are ten or eleven different areas. So we're in Area E. Chicago and the west side of Lake Michigan is Area K. Um, the Early parts of the alphabet are all on the East Coast, and uh, the area J is, I think, Southern California. The letters get bigger as you move west. Are there any rhyme or reasons to the boundaries of those areas, or is it by, based on X amount of boats and population, or is it just a throw it against the wall and see if it sticks? Um, well, there's kind of a rhyme. You know, area E is the eastern part of the Great Lakes, and the and also the inland lakes that are near that area K takes in, you know, Lake Michigan, Scow Country, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and even some of the places west of that. So there's there's kind of a geographical thing to it. And when you get to New England, there's a bunch of letters in there because there was a lot of sailing. And I think that was done to kind of try and even out the number of boats. But those boundaries are lost in the fog of history. Um, I have no idea if, well, I, I guess we could count, uh, U.S. Sailing could tell us how the members break down, for example, but, uh, uh, because we're pretty sure that there aren't, there are a bunch of U.S. Sailing members, even in, you know, Colorado and Nevada and, uh, and other places you don't think of as having a lot of, say, Arizona, but they, you know, they are there and they're, you know, they're, they're in an appropriate area. Uh, that the areas also uh, form the uh, uh, or used to form the kind of how you you ended up getting an appeal, but now that's done through your regional sailing association. And if you don't like the answer there, then it goes to U.S. Sailing. We have, if you watch social media, certainly we have. We're having a difficulty with officials in every sport, mostly because younger kids don't, younger folks don't want to come into the sport and get yelled at, whether it's, you know, football, basketball. And sailing seems to also suffer from a lack of younger officials or, or more importantly, just a lack of officials in general. Finding qualified PROs has become every year more and more of a, of a difficulty. So first, my question is, is that a fair premise? And if so, what's your thoughts? Well, you know, back when I started sailing, sailors accepted way poorer race management than they would ever today. And when we started sailing, we had five fixed marks on the lake. And the race committee would go out and they'd say, well, if we start here, that one's kind of the windward. And so we'll race there. And then if the wind shifted, 
and it ended up just being a parade of reaches around the marks. Well, that was the luck of the draw, and well, better luck, uh, you know, better luck next week. And sailors really don't accept that now. They want a pretty square starting line and a square beat, and they and the thing that's even tougher is a square downwind run, so that there can be the tactics of going this way or that way and not just a, a parade. So first of all, you know, qualified race officers, you know, that's the, uh, you know, that's the problem. But part of the problem is the racers expect a higher quality racing than what they did 50 years ago. Um, U.S. Sailing does have some provisions to, because, you know, you got to go attend the seminar and take the tests and do other things to get certified. They do have support for younger people to help the, um, to help with the financial uh, side of that. And what I try to tell people to encourage that is that I find that being a racing sailor makes me a better judge and being a judge makes me a better racing sailor for exactly the reasons that Dave Perry talked about in your previous show is that <clears throat> When you get into situations, you can be confident about what your rights and obligations are. And so you don't, I don't say you can be aggressive, but you uh, were aggressive as Dave, as Dave used it, but you don't have to hang back out of fear. I've and always, I try to use that to encourage people. I, I've always said that coaches of non-sailing sports should have to referee a couple of times just to get an understanding and a feel, there would be far less hysterics on the sidelines if a guy understood how, what an official has to go through for an opportunity. Because I worked in the Big Ten. I worked a lot of places, and I've never once – this is the, my favorite line from somebody. Well, they're they're cheating or they're evening it up or they're doing whatever. I've worked with plenty of bad officials and good officials. I've had bad days. In 40 years of being a sports official, not one time did anybody ever cheat. Not once. They never had that conversation. Now, I can't get into somebody's brain, but I think they were pretty honorable guys, and I think the, the, the general public you know, completely misconstrued that, that premise. I think, that's, I think there's some truth to that. I really believe that to be uh, a, a paradigm that I strongly believe in. Yeah, I've, many times in protest hearings, as the judges are considering their decision, they'll have somebody will come along and say, you know, why isn't this a rule two, a fair sailing issue? I, you know, he must have known that he uh, that he violated that rule and did it anyway. And so that, you know, that's fair sailing. And you can't you can't throw out a disqualification under the fair sailing rule. And my point is, again, I can't get into their head and I never ascribe to malice what can be adequately explained by stupidity. Understand. Um, is sail sail race judging like baseball umpiring somewhat sometimes subjective? Mm. Uh, well, in, in a lot of cases, uh, let, let's take the, the usual case where you're hearing a protest after the uh, after the incident. And in that case, uh, you know, you let one party move the boat models around and say, this is what I, I think that happens. And then you let the other party move the boat models around and say, this is what I think that happens. And when you get into the deliberation, the judges will say, were these people on the same planet? You know, <clears throat> and the tough part, I mean, the way I tend to approach things is let's get the models out where the judges are deliberating and agree on the positions of the boats and the, the sequence of events. If we can make a, a model of it, we can make the boat models track so that you know, the boats aren't suddenly levitating in one direction or the other. If we can come up with a sequence of events, then we can apply the rules. Then we can decide who was right, who was wrong, whether there was no penalty, whether this guy should be penalized, that guy, or in some cases, both of them. But the key is to, you try to make it not subjective by agreeing on the positions of the boats and their obligations and the time spans involved. I asked the question because the strike zone generally is a little larger in a 10-run <laughs> game than a one-run game. Yeah. 
calling off, you know, calling holding on the backside of a football play so that you have to blow another whistle. I, we've said this before, good officiating is understanding when not to blow the whistle, make sure it works its way through. But then I see, and I don't want to get into the minutia here, but I see the decision that Area E made last year for the Great Lakes 52 boats where some rules were written and then maybe a Philadelphia lawyer came in and the guy won the battle but then was asked not to be part of the fleet and it was, you know, big guys with their money and riches. And I get all that part of it, but it was interesting because they massaged it to make it the answer and eventual maybe instead of a definitive yes or no. And nobody was happy. So everybody went, went away for the winter. And so it happens in all sports is I guess my point. Yeah. I, uh, I was on the uh, area appeals committee that heard that appeal. Uh, and um, we, uh, uh, we spent some time on that, uh, you know, if, pounding our heads on the table to uh, to decide that appeal. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there. I just, I, there was, we covered it. It was just interesting listening to both sides of the argument. And I would have not want to have been in that room with you, but I, I understand that. Let me change well, something. I have to say, I, first of all, I can highly recommend Matt Bounds as the chair of the DRY Appeals Committee who was assigned that appeal, um, uh, who was assigned that appeal for various reasons. Um, and the way the appeals process works, right, if you don't like the decision of a, of a protest committee, you've got uh, 14 days to send your appeal to U.S. Sailing. You send it to U.S. Sailing, and then they decide what uh, regional sailing appeals committee is going to hear it. And for something like like that, with uh, with all the people that were involved in the original protest committee for the Great Lakes 52, the decision was made to pull the pin, let the handle fly off, and then count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and lob it over the bulkhead to uh, to Matt and, and DRYA. And Matt did an excellent job of recruiting other. Uh, international judges, even from Canada, to serve on that appeals committee, uh, because of the uh, uh, of the people that had decided the original protest, uh, as well as the the gravity of the situation. In a couple of conversations, I think I used the word Corinthian more than once in terms of not in necessarily being an amateur, but in the spirit of the rule. But it turned out to be there were more lawyers in the room than there were Corinthian sailors. So off they moved. And thank God for Mr. Bounds. And again, I would not have wanted to be in that position. And, and we'll leave that for another day. We'll see where, where the fleet goes. La last couple questions, because we're going to definitely visit throughout the summer, because we want to be able to understand some of the, the rules better. What do you think is the most often a misconstrued or abused rule in sailing at the amateur level that that we see around both Interlake and maybe some of the Great Lakes? Well, clearly the longest single rule in the book and the easiest one to screw up on is rule 18 that has to do with mark roundings. Okay. And, uh, and, and I think that's the one that people struggle with uh, the most. The second one, I'll, I'll second Dave Perry's uh, idea that rule 16, the rule about altering course and giving the, when a right-of-way boat alters course, it has to give uh, the other boat uh, room, the uh, time and space and the prevailing conditions to keep clear. So I'd say 16 and 18 together are the two. You know, you know rule 31, don't touch a mark. That's pretty simple. Port versus starboard, that's pretty simple. But I'd say 16 and 18. And, okay. and the rules writers have struggled with 18 repeatedly um, to, to get where we are today. Curious. Again, at Crescent, we have Mark Set Bot that came out of Crescent in terms of its process. Does a fixed mark at the bottom of a lake on, a, on, a, on an anchor less or more effective than a, than a Mark Set Bot that's a, a movable product, movable object? Or is it pretty much the same? Well, you know, a, an anchored mark will still move. Okay. And uh, and I think 
that's uh, the mark set bots um, in in places where there is no current, they tend to move around more. Okay, if if you've got a steady current, then the current's always pushing the bot in one direction, and it does a pretty good job of moving along or in a pretty uh, a pretty well defined uh, line to get back, back to its back to its position. But the uh, but most places when you're exposing sailors for the first time to mark set bots, it's a good idea to remind them that not even an anchored mark never moves. They do bounce around. And so you just got to give them a little bit bigger uh, berth than what you do with the uh, with an anchored with an anchored mark. Well, if marks move, then it really only assists those at the end of the race because the guys at the beginning of the race have a farther way to go. And the guys are coming behind as the mark moves again, if it's with the current, then it becomes a, a completely different story. So maybe we are assisting those at the back of the pack. Well, but the, the mark goes back to its original position and it's, it, it doesn't know if there are other boats around, you know, okay. it's constantly doing that. Mm. All right. That, that makes sense. Can it, Last couple questions. If you don't know a lot about racing and haven't read the rules of the road, if you apply common sense and understand that, let's just for the sake of argument and semantics suggest that it's common sense is what we would both agree upon in most situations. If you apply common sense, aren't the rules pretty simple? Well, they're very, um, yeah, they're, they're logically constructed. Uh, particularly after the rewrite in 1996 that came into effect in 1997, where they put the, the right-of-way rules went right to the front of the book, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, okay? Or, and um, that's a good thing for beginning sailors because the, the rule book itself can be pretty intimidating, right. but you, it's at the front where the important stuff is, and they're pretty common sense. You have to pick... Pick a tack that's got right away, and we pick starboard. Um, and there, there's a rationale for why that is. That uh, Pat Healy can uh, uh, has a nice diagram to do that. That we don't need to go in. We don't need to go into. Uh, one of the things I should mention is that um, one of the things our club has done now. This is the fifth year. Is we have this thing called the Racing Rules Book Club. And it's a Zoom meeting that uh, that occurs every Thursday. Uh, unfortunately, our first session is going to overlap with Dave's session at, at Crescent. But I uh, use the quizzes from Dave's book, uh, in particular the ones about the right-of-way rules and rules in the front of the book. And we'll present the quiz. And then I have everybody that signs into the Zoom meeting, and there can be a dozen or more people we have them go around and give their idea, and then I display some of the rules that are, apply here. And then I ask people what they think about how the protest should be decided. And only after we've kind of come to a consensus do I show what the answer is. And we'll go through four or five quizzes in an hour and a half, and that's usually about enough, and then everybody's you know, brain, brain fog. But uh, people have told me, particularly our beginning sailors, that they really appreciate this because it uh, it, it gets them more familiarity with the rule, um, and it shows an actual situation that I, I try to pick something that isn't too outlandish, something that's pretty common. Right. Uh, that makes sense. I'm a firm believer <clears throat> in covering all the sports we've covered and played and coached. I believe, honestly, that most people are, are pretty honest. And the guy that cheats on the golf course, you know, he keeps a ball in his sock and has a wedge come out of it, or he, he's the only guy that ever finds his own ball – He's the same guy that probably cheats on a on a on a sail racing course, and he doesn't get a lot of folks uh, that sail with him or golf with him eventually. Because, again, I believe most people are pretty honest. Because I understand that it's their Super Bowl on Sunday, and there's competitive juice, and it goes to all the things and their frustrations. But at the end of the day, there's rules so that people are safe, which is why rules are in place. I've never seen a rule. Very rarely does a rule put in place for any sport that isn't revolved around safety. And I think sometimes that gets lost in translation. Yep. That makes any sense. Uh, there are, um, I know uh, Dick Rose 
once wrote about there were four reasons why the rules committee ever changed the rule. Okay. And one of the reasons, first of all, was safety. People are to prevent unsafe things from happening. But one of the other ones was, you know, here's something that technically is, is prohibited by the rules, but everybody's doing it anyway. And, and the, you know, the people that play the game kind of want to do this. And so we better rewrite the rules so that it isn't illegal. Um, and, and I forget what the other, uh, is it, 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 mostly to, to reflect how people want to play the game. And uh, that's a, that's always a good, a good way. So in addition to safety, it tends to reflect how people want to play the game. But oh, nobody right. wants to play it, you know, just, you know, <laughs> nobody wants to allow you to pick up and throw your golf ball. No, I, I, I yeah, no, I, that's right. And that's my kind of my point is all years of officiating is that I think most people accept the rules are fair. And there's that rare exception where you've just got to, hammer somebody because they're, they're going to figure out a way to <clears throat> i know the only idea is if you're not tr you're not cheating you're not trying and i i think that's a you know it's obviously a, a, the vernacular doesn't work and i understand the premise but i think again i think most folks are are fair and, I, and you know it is one of the one of the things that judges you know always have in their back pocket is uh, first of all rule two the fair sailing rule and the second one is rule 69 the misconduct rule and now that they've kind of rewritten that in the last couple of rule book cycles, okay, it's not gross misconduct, it's just misconduct. And so if you see somebody doing something that is unsportsmanlike or could bring the sport into disrepute, you can, and it doesn't have to be before protest time ends, okay, at any time related to an event, you can make a report to the judges, the judges may then uh, call a hearing. And in most cases, by the time you get to the hearing and you get the miscreant in there, they're, they're, you know, they're begging for forgiveness. They're, they're apologizing. They don't want to get, uh, because the, the range of penalties is extreme. You can, it goes for everything from a warning to if you take significant action and report that to U.S. Sailing, it can, lead to you being essentially banned from the sport for a period of time so we've always we've got ways of dealing with folks that that do unsportsmanlike things in the national high school federation rule books which govern all high school sports there are 18 rules and i always occasionally quote rule 19 and the coach will ask me what is rule 19 i says it's whatever i make up at the moment to control the point because at that <laughs> moment i need control to, to, to use the rules one through 18 so you, you understand the you know you understand the process well listen I, i'm really looking forward to being a part of, of this as we go through this and talk about rules throughout this season i think there's some things that are going to come up i did get a chance to ask you a little bit about the gp52 rule so i will not ask you about the lawsuit between u.s sailing and america one we'll save that for another day uh, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, and we've done a pretty good job the last couple of weeks of talking to both the U.S. Sailing president and its new Olympic coach and avoiding that discussion, but I think we're going to see some information coming up pretty quick. So, I it, have never, I, I have not yet met a person that doesn't fervently wish that we can get beyond this lawsuit and get to supporting our, the sailing team in Marseille and L.A. 2028. Everybody wants, everybody wants, wants that america one racing wants that the sailing team wants that the, the only question is how do we get from here to there yeah the bridge that's being burnt or built depending on your perspective is uh has been a fun one to watch that's not, not true it's been an interesting one to watch and a, a sad one in some cases and i know i said when we're going to talk about it but and we'll get to it sometime hopefully this summer i've had a chance as we've talked before i've had a chance to have conversations with both sides of the party which is unusual because most people haven't yeah. and i know both sides because i've at least on the current u.s sailing side i have some 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 background and, and some familiarity good mm -hmm. folks just maybe misdirected is i'll leave it at that at the moment but again we both hope for the best with an olympic year 
and I remind I remind this of both the U.S. sailing guys. I said, you know, if you look at your membership, it goes up about 15 percent during an Olympic year. So it's also a dollars and cents decision, not only just a in an, an age when attrition is part of what's hurting you. You need to keep as many in the family and under the tent as as, as is possible. So it'll be a, a fun summer. So, Clark, I listen. I appreciate the insight. And what I really appreciate is you giving us. I, I we're really trying hard with the show to make sure that if you don't know, you got a place to go find an answer or, or questions that I'm asking that maybe the average guy just doesn't doesn't know how to ask. And so your explanations, much like Dave Perry's last week, were simple, consistent, and concise. So that's been really terrific and again we appreciate your time just wanted to say thank you to wally to jim and certainly to clark for all their insight for this week we're going to take the show a little bit on the road meaning we're going to be a little less zoom conversation we'll see if we can't get out and find ourselves a palm tree and hopefully uh some better scenery and if we can't pick it up but we're also going to try and bring you the same information we've always brought you so that being the case we uh look forward to next week so thanks for your time and uh for all the guys in back we'll see you next time